Awesome. So recently, if most of you guys have been following the channel at all, I've uh, moved up to the Trinov Altitude 16 processor, which in my eyes is kind of like the Mount Everest of processors for surround sound. So I was very happy to get that in here. Um, but also, John, I w I'm curious to know, what are the big differences? Like, why is there such a big price discrepancy between the Trinov products and, say, a flagship, say, Den on Morantz? I don't want to name names, but we know who they are. Why is there such a big price yeah. discrepancy between the Trinov and the other other bigger brands out there? Well, the, the sort of pat answer is that we do a lot of things that nobody else does. Um, and, and that's not dissing the Denons and Marantzes of the world because, you know, the 8805 for the amount of money that's involved, I, I think is a killer product. It's, you know, it, it's a huge value. Um, but the fact is we do a lot of things that you just can't do with an architecture of that type. And, and there are also, frankly, a lot of products out there with very similar architectures that cost a lot more than the Denon and Marantzes of the world. And they don't necessarily do a lot more. They, they usually do some more. So I, to give you a specific example, um, we're probably best known for a handful of things, but one of them is the fact that we have a software-based architecture. So uh, rather than waiting for Texas Instruments or analog devices to come out with a new version of some DSP chip that they built for the mass market, um, the way that works normally is that we'll use Dolby Atmos as the example. Dolby will give the golden code, uh, which is their definition of this is how Atmos is supposed to work. They'll hand that off to people who are known as implementors, which is distinct from integrators. Um, the implementors are companies like Cirrus Logic, Texas Instruments, uh, Analog Devices, and Trinoff. Um, those other companies, leaving aside Trinoff, um, their job is to build chips that they can sell a lot of because the first one costs a huge amount of money in R and D to, to to develop, and after that they can stamp them out at pretty cost effectively. But to recover the money, they have to sell billions of not billions, but they have to sell a lot of these things. So by definition, it's a mass market kind of process. That's their business model. Um, by comparison, we take that same golden code from Dolby or DTS or Oral. Um, because they are scientists, they generally develop it on a Linux platform. Because we were founded by scientists, we also have a Linux platform called the Trinov OS. Um, it is a highly refined version of Linux that's been optimized for the kinds of things we do, audio. We, we don't, there aren't a lot of printer drivers or you know, any of that nonsense in mm -hmm. there. It's really focused on you know, the kinds of stuff we do. And as such, it's relatively easy for us to port the original Dolby Atmos golden code in this example into our environment. We don't have to, first of all, we don't have to wait for some chip company to spend a year and a half or two years developing the chip. We don't then have to figure out how to in integrate that chip into a board of some sort that will work within the context of our product. You know, that whole process is called product integration. You're integrating somebody else's chip into your product. Um, we skip that part entirely, and, and what it means, among other things, is that we're typically first to market, oftentimes by you know, 18 to 24 months, um, with the latest and greatest and you know, cool new things, because we're implementing it directly ourselves instead of waiting for a chip come. It also means that we don't have to put up with any of the, for want of a better word, any of the compromises that you know, some engineer in Texas makes based on his or her impression of what's good enough. So sticking with Atmos, for example, in late 2014, we were able to decode and render up to 32 unique channels of Dolby Atmos, 2014. Um, nobody can do that even now except for us. On the same, uh, on the same unit, by the way. Yeah, yeah, the, Alti the original Altitude 32 came out toward the end of 2014. Uh, we had Atmos on it that fall. Um, we had Oro on it at ISC the following February 2015. Uh, DTS-X uh, we had running summer of 2017, if I remember right. Yep. Uh, and most recently, we now have DTS-X Pro, uh, which, just to make sure everybody understands among your viewers, DTS-X Pro is a different decoder. The encode process is exactly the same. 
So every DTSX disk that you already own, the, the difference is really one more of licensing than technology. Um, we were not allowed to render the available information to more than 11.1 channels by licensing agreement until fairly recently. And we worked very closely with DTS all of last year to you know put the finishing touches on DTSX Pro and implement it and go through the certification process. Mm -hmm. But the main difference is that we can now take that same object-oriented data and render it to all 30.2 channels that were originally specified and available in the commercial, you know, commercial cinema version of DTSX. Uh, but now you can do it in your home. Uh, that was kind of a long-winded response, but but yeah, we we're first to the market with the latest and coolest technologies with fewer compromises. We do everything at 64-bit floating point processing, which is insane accuracy. Uh, whereas at best, the DSP chips are using 32-bit floating point. Mm -hmm. um, we can do other things like <clears throat> typically the, the DSP chip that's doing the decoding, right? That's taking the Atmos bit stream and turning it into X number of channels. Um, those chips all run at a set frequency. It's usually 48 kilohertz. Occasionally, you'll see something with that's running at 96. But anything else, anything that comes into the box that's not already at that frequency has to be sample rate converted to what the DSP chip is, you know, ready to do. So if you have, if you're just listening to Redbook CD, you you have to do a fractional sample rate conversion from 44.1 to 48. And and while a power of two sample rate conversion can be done pretty pretty transparently, the fractional ones have a sound of their own, and we're trying to avoid that. So in the Altitude 16, as an example, if you play Redbook CD, we do all of our processing at 44,100 times per second. If you play a movie, those are almost always 48 kilohertz, so we operate at that frequency, 88 to 96. If you put 192 kilohertz in, we will downsample to 96, which again is a power of two, so you can do that pretty well. But even there, we're operating on you know, what we're trying to do is operate on the original data rather than a facsimile of the original data. And given the fact that, okay, most movies are 48, so running at 48 is not too bad. But if you ever listen to music, chances are you're listening to other than 48. Mm -hmm. And we'd rather work on the original data. So that's what we do.